and linear okay so i'm pretty sure that you guys have been exposed to angular and linear velocity when you did a course in perhaps dynamics where uh, you were essentially looking at planar motions so planar case So this object is in the x, y plane, sort of like this x, y plane, and then it's spinning about the z axis. So the axis is pointing uh, at right angles to the uh, right angles to the plane. So let P be a point on the object. This is a vector r which is from the origin to the point p so let's define r vector from o to p mega is the angular velocity so angular velocity if you recollect was simply theta dot times k theta dot is the magnitude of the velocity as I've shown it and then if you want to find the velocity of point p velocity of p that would just be velocity is omega crossed with r where r is the position of point p with respect to o so vector from o to p Okay, so now uh, we are in this course interested in 3D motions, which is a whole new level. So imagine an object, and this is, it doesn't have to be planar, it can be any solid object. Okay, uh, it could be spinning about the x axis, y axis, z axis. So for this case, you just cannot write the angular velocity as omega x i plus omega y i, omega y j plus omega z k. That is not always true. And that's why 3D motions are much harder. You, know, you never get to learn 3D motions in a first course in dynamics. So this may be true in some cases, but in general, not true. However, V equals say a point P vector R. So if you want to find the velocity of point P, let me put it P here. Okay. Velocity of P is omega cross R is still true. Okay. Provided you have the right omega, that omega does not equal to omega x i plus omega y j. It's not equal to. So don't make the mistake of just assuming omega equals that formula in three dimensions. In two dimensions, this is right. Uh, this is always true. This is not true as I've shown you, and this is true. So uh, the the goal today is to uh, figure out a formula for angular speed because that will later be used to do things like uh, finding the velocities of points on the manipulator. Once you find the velocity of the points on the manipulator, one thing we're interested in is we want the end effector to go at a certain speed. So how do you know the speed? Unless you find the angular 
speed of the different uh, joints, you cannot find the linear speed of the end effector. And that's important because sometimes you want the manipulator to go at a certain speed and pick up something. So you are interested in linear speed uh, of the end effector okay? and for other points too. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a skew symmetric matrix and we'll see that the skew symmetric matrix actually is the right way of describing rotations or um, uh, 3D motions of rigid objects. So let's start with skew symmetric matrices. I believe I've, I did talk about this very briefly in the first lecture. So skew <coughs> symmetric matrix. This is a very special matrix. Uh, since we are talking about uh, three dimensions, we are only looking at three by three matrices. So if you have a vector, consider the vector So I'll write the vector as a as a matrix AX, AY, AZ. Okay, which means that the X component is AX, Y component is AY, Z component is AZ. The skew symmetric matrix corresponding to vector A is defined as follows: zero minus AZ, AY. So this is what is known as a skew symmetric matrix. Okay, uh, it has it is associated with a vector a x a y a z. If you try to take the matrix, so let me put properties of skew symmetric. Matrix. So that also be true for a skew matrix. Yeah. So for a skew symmetric matrix, you'll always see that if you take the matrix and you sum it with its transpose, and you can do this perhaps uh, in your in your head. You don't need to actually do this. You see that it's equal to zero. When I say zero, it's not the number zero, but it's a three by three matrix of zeros. Okay. So that is how you know, people normally define skew symmetric matrix. If you see S plus S transpose equals zero, then it means that S is a skew symmetric matrix. The uh, some some other properties are if you have S of alpha A plus S of beta B, alpha beta are constants, A B are vectors then you can simply write this as s times alpha times s of a plus beta times s of b uh, this is uh, what is known as the commuted uh, forget it is called i think it's commutative property of matrices the terminology is not important just that this expansion is true if you want to do this particular cross product a cross b then you can write it as a skew symmetric matrix associated with A times B. What's that? Associative property, right? Associative property. You can associate um, S with A and S with B when there's a sum, right? That's right. It's called associative property. This is what we had done in the first class. I, I showed you that, and I proved this in class that if you have A cross B, then you can write it as. The skew symmetric matrix associated with A times B. So this will be 3 times 3 for S of A and 3 times 1 for B. And so you will have um, a vector effectively of 3 by 1, and that's your A cross B. It's a nice uh, property because now you don't have to do this uh, cross product. You can carry out multiplication of two matrices. If you have S of R of A, where R is the rotation matrix, then you can write this as R times S of A times R transpose. Now that is perhaps slightly more harder to prove 
uh, the way I would proceed is I would take an R matrix, multiply it with A, uh, get the vector, and then just just show it by putting an a, putting an R. That's uh, but that is true. Okay, and and we'll use this in some proofs today. This is going to be used. And this one is really hard to believe that this is true. Uh, the next one it is says that x transpose s of x equals zero, where x is any uh, vector. In this case, it's three by one. Okay. I believe you can prove that by assuming any x, x one, x two, x three. Uh, and then just taking that product and you'll see it's equal to zero. Okay, so the four properties, the fourth one we'll be using a little bit uh, today. Uh, this is useful, we did it in the first class. Or no second class, I think. Okay, so uh, with that, we'll get into rotation matrices. Number one for matrices and number five for vectors. Number one for matrices. Number one is, well, it's just, yeah, we can say that. That's for matrices. Uh, this is for vectors, yeah. Okay. Let's get into the derivative of a rotation matrix. Okay. Uh, a rotation matrix, as you, you remember, it was used to relate one frame with another frame when you rotate the, the coordinate frame. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just start off with the rotation matrix, take the derivative, because it seems that the rotation matrix is probably related to the angular speed of an object. So let's see how it is related by just starting off naively, uh, assuming the rotation matrix, consider R of the theta, okay? Uh, theta describes the rotation. It could be rotation about the x, y, and z. It's not very important uh, what rotation it is. It's, this is going to be very generic. Okay, R of t is a rotation matrix. Now, there's one property of a rotation matrix is that the transpose of the matrix times the matrix equals identity. This is a property of a rotation matrix. So let's start by taking the derivative of this expression with respect to time. Differentiate with respect to time. Actually, let's do with respect to theta first, and we'll do the time part a little later. Because I wrote r as a function of theta, so it doesn't make sense to take derivative with respect to time. So d rt d theta and this is uh, using the what do you call uh, the ab rule if you remember for differentiation you take the derivative of the first term keep the second term constant then uh, keep the sec the first term constant and take the derivative of the second term with respect to whatever parameter i is a constant, so its derivative is 0. Oh. It will actually be consistent with the notes. This doesn't change anything. Uh, except that my expression of s will be slightly different. I started off assuming r, r transpose, really the same thing. If you switch it, it's not going to change this. So I'm just trying to be consistent with my notes. I'm just going to switch the transpose because that will determine how I, comp uh, how I write my skew symmetric matrix and everything builds on that. So let's switch that. It doesn't change the anything. 
Okay, so now I'm going to rewrite the second term. Keep the first term as it is. As what I'll do is I'll switch the order of multiplication. Okay, uh, but you, you've seen that, well, I've not completed it, you've seen that when you try to do A, B, in, this was probably in the first homework, and you try to do B, A, A, B is not equal to B, A, so you can't just randomly switch. Actually, there's a property of matrices which says that if you have A, B, and if you want to switch them, then you can do this. Is this did you check this? I think this was also part of the homework. AB uh, equals B transpose A transpose is perfectly valid. This is a this is always true. So I'm going to use the same thing, which is I'll switch the two, but I'll also put a transpose. So I'll take this is my B. I replace B with B is dr transpose d theta. When I take the transpose of transpose, I end I end up with dr d theta. Ah, oh, something is not right. Something is not right. Yeah, I think this is wrong. This is the property. A B uh, transpose is equal to B transpose A transpose. No, but that is true. Not A B equals B transpose A transpose. So if I have A B transpose and B transpose A transpose, uh, so uh, in order to follow that, and just to convince you that I'm going to use that, I'm going to rewrite this slightly differently. I'll write this as transpose times transpose. Okay, so I'm doing nothing. I'm just putting two transposes, and when two transposes will give me the same matrix, right? If you have a transpose of transpose, it's going to be a. So I, what I did was I put transpose of transpose, and what I'm going to do is take this transpose. And use this particular property. So now I can switch. Uh, if A is R, B is B R D theta transpose, then I can switch them using that transpose. So I'm going to rewrite this as T R D theta goes with the transpose. Sorry, without the transpose times R T. Okay. And what I've done here is I effectively replace this part with this using that identity. I have to carry this transpose forward because that has not been used in substituting. So I keep that transpose, the outermost transpose. So let me rewrite this as tr b theta r t. I'm just going to skip theta for a second just to make it clean dr d theta times r transpose this whole thing transpose equal to zero okay just skip the theta in the brackets so what you see is if this term if i assume it to be a skew symmetric matrix in fact it is a skew symmetric matrix because when i do s plus s transpose i have zero so what this tells me is that the matrix, this matrix, the product of those two matrices will give me a skew symmetric matrix because I have ended up with S plus S transpose equals zero. So this is a, this part is a skew symmetric matrix.
so s equals dr p theta r transpose okay, let me rewrite that again the next page s equals dr d theta times r transpose of theta so this is the expression of the after i have now been able to relate the rate of change of r with respect to theta in terms of s if you want to simplify this a little bit you can uh, post multiply by r of theta post multiplying is the process of multiplying both sides on the right side by uh, the, uh, r of theta so so i'm allowed to do the same multiplication provided the same multiplication in the same way is done on both sides so i cannot put r of theta on the right side and r of theta on the left side i can't do that as long as i put the same multiplication on the same side i'm allowed to multiply uh this is not like ab equals b right that's all not true so the reason i did this was because i noticed this thing is simply the identity matrix r transpose r equals i or r r transpose i and so another way of deriving a formula for dr d theta which is this equals s times r of theta so if you want to find an expression for the rate of change of r with respect to theta this is the expression if you want to find an expression for the skew symmetric matrix that's the expression but they come from the same expression okay uh, this is just going to motivate angular speed so you see soon that dr d theta is actually related to the angular speed of a rigid body in three dimensions okay, let's do a simple a uh, straightforward example of computing uh, dr d theta and s okay here is an example for r equals r x theta where clearly r x theta is the rotation by an angle theta about the x axis we've done this formula uh, a while back find d r d theta and second part is find s or the skew symmetric matrix corresponding to that rotation so for part 1 what we'll do is we'll write an expression for r and this is just you got to turn your pages and see what the formula was was cosine theta sin theta 0 minus sin theta plus sin theta okay, so that was r like r x comma theta so if you want to find dr d theta what you do essentially is you go about taking the derivative with respect to theta for each of those elements so element by element so the first element is 1 derivative is 0 or zeros the derivative of cosine is minus sin derivative of sin is plus cosine next is sin is cosine cosine is minus sin and so that is my answer to the first question the derivative with respect to theta okay second one i need to find s so for s we'll use the formula we've uh, we've derived earlier s is simply dr d theta times r transpose uh, luckily we've already computed dr d theta it's 0 0 0 0 minus sin theta and for r transpose we just take the r which we defined this one and then take the transpose of that so 1 0 0 0 cosine theta 
that will become plus sine theta 0 minus sine theta okay now when you do this multiplication it looks very complicated it turns out when you do this computation it simplifies and you do not have to do it by hand if you can always use MATLAB you can do sims theta and then do that multiplication it actually boils down to something very very uh, simple it gives you okay that thing is independent of theta it only has uh, ones now do you recognize what this is this is a skew symmetric matrix for sure it's a very special skew symmetric matrix it's a skew symmetric matrix corresponding to i if you take i i is just one ax equals one then you'll put ax here remember minus ax a y a z a y is zero because uh, i has no j component and no k component so that's s of i so if you take the rotation matrix corresponding to rotation about uh, theta then you get s of i which is not surprising uh, if i if i tell you what is the rotation uh, what essentially i'm doing here is i'm rotate, rotating by unit angle not rate but unit angle here because it's not a function of time yet then you will basically find that that is actually rotation about the x axis which you got similarly if you define r to be so actually let me summarize this this what we found essentially is that if you take d d theta r x theta then you'll get a very special skew symmetric matrix which is s of i times r x theta so this is the relation between d t theta and s that s was unknown we found it to be s of i similarly If you do d r y d theta, then it will come out to be s of j, and this is something which you can check. And then if you do d r z d theta, so so far we're still in planar world we are only looking at one rotation rotation about the x-axis y-axis z-axis so it's not surprising that you find that those so we want to find uh, omega right omega x omega y omega z we only looked at uh, the derivative of um, r with respect to theta so let's assume r is a function of time now And uh, what we, what I would claim, and this is like, so one way of proving things is you start with what you know, and you go keep going forward till you end up with something which you would like to prove, right? That's the normal way proofs go. Another way of proving things is let's assume something which may or may not be true, okay? And then go about uh, uh, solving it and trying to get to a form, an expression which we know is true. And if that expression is true, then what we started off is is the right assumption. So it's reversing the logic. We could have reversed it and started from what we know and got to what we un what we did not know. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume. Okay, so bear with me. Once I'm done with the proof, I'll give get back to this argument of why this is true. So assume that R dot of t which is simply dr when i say r dot it will mean with respect to time okay if it's uh, dr d theta i will never put r dot i'll just say dr d theta is equal to s omega t r of t okay okay when we assume this and there's a caveat I'm assuming it to be true. I have not shown it is to be true. Okay. 
I need to show, prove it to you that this is true. I'm just going to start off with this. And so what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to start with something I know now. I know that the position of a point P equals R10 times P1, right? This is something which you've written down many times in this class. Uh, if I want to find the position of a point P in a rotated frame, it's R10 times P1. Let's differentiate this with respect to time. With respect to time. So I get P dot 0 equals, well, what is P dot? Well, it's always T P D T equals Okay, now I'm going to assume that P1 doesn't change with time, that vector is fixed. It's like a, a, if you think of a point and an object, and I rotate it, that point, that distance is not going to change with respect to time, so it's fixed. So when I take this derivative, though it's A times B, only one parameter varies, and that parameter is R10 with respect to time. P1 remains a constant, so I don't have a second term in volume P1 dot. Okay, which is R1. Okay, let's call this expression, which I assume to be 1. Let's call this 2. So, next step is put 1 in 2. So, P dot 0 equals r dot 1 0 so I'm going to put this thing in this expression so I would have s omega times r so I need to put the right r here I have r 1 0 because whatever this r is the same r goes here and since I have r 1 with respect to frame 0 I would have r 1 with respect to frame 0 times p 1 Okay. But we see that S omega, this thing here, is simply P0. Where do I get it from? Well, I get it from here. Right. P0 is R10 times P1. So what I can do is, of course, replace uh, that thing with P0. But we've seen that when you have s omega times p, where omega is a vector, p is a vector, you can write this as p dot 0 equals omega cross p, right? This follows from v this follows from a cross b equals s of a something which we have used in the past, right? I've shown this to you. But what we notice is that this expression which we got is something we've seen in the past. It's actually velocity of a point equals omega cross r. Okay, so what I've found out is after doing all these computations, I found a formula which I know is always true. For a rigid body, V equals omega R is always true. So I started off with an assumption my assumption was that I use that assumption in order to derive this formula which is true so I can make the claim that my assumption was true. Now you could do it in reverse. You could start off this way right, and backtrack and not Assume that if you just backtrack and show that uh, you get to that expression, and it will also be true. I just said I thought this is easier logic. So, the two ways to prove things you start with what you know, and you just go ahead and then prove whatever is unknown or not true. But here I did, I did a reverse process. I started off assuming that this is true, and then I saw something. I came to a point where I know that this is true, which means that what I started off has to be right. 
Okay. So the point of doing all this is to say that what I assumed was absolutely right. This thing is how rotation matrix is related to uh, omega. Omega is the angular speed. Omega has omega x, omega y, omega z. If you want to find omega x, omega z, uh, you need to use that expression. So let me summarize it here. So r dot equals s of omega times r is true. And if you want to find s, it's simply r dot. Right, how will you find s? You multiply both sides, force multiply by r transpose r transpose. So the r, r transpose becomes i. And so s is equal to r dot times r transpose. So both those expressions, well, one is derived from the other, right, are true. So if you know the angular speed, you can find r dot using that expression. Or if you know r dot, okay, which is usually mm -hmm. harder to find, then you can multiply the r transpose to get s. So we're sort of building up to the point where we'll be looking at rotations in just uh, a little bit. Okay, let me, uh, a bit about notations. So when we wrote this expression down, I ignored the putting uh, subscripts and superscripts to R, but these rotations are always with respect to some frame, right? So uh, what we'll do is the omega is has actually three indices which denote it. What this means is it's going to be rotation or angular velocity associated with R J I. Okay. So that's the R you'll use. But that angular velocity is uh, is in the frame. Okay. So you can find angular velocity of any object in any other frame. So when you find omega h, it's rotation associated with two frames, one zero, or it could be one two, or it could be two zero, whatever it is. But that angular velocity can be all written in a different frame, and that is just the notation we'll be using. Uh, when we have i equals k equals zero, uh, we'll just skip. Instead of carrying this three indices, what we'll do is, instead of writing it as that, we'll simply write it as this, just to simplify our life and not having to write too many zeros. Okay. So uh, even though I written an omega i, j, k, most times we are always trying to find this kind of expression. We are always finding uh, angular speeds of frame j with respect to base frame. So we'll always be dealing with omega j. So you don't have to worry too much about uh, running three indices. But when I say omega j, it always would mean I'm always looking at those angular speed with respect to frame zero. Here is an example. which is continuation of what we did. If r equals rx theta, where theta is equal to omega t. Okay, theta is defined as the rotation about the x-axis. I'm just going to make that, the, I'm going to impose the fact that theta is going to be rotating at a constant speed. So this is, the angular rotation is speed times time. Okay, then the question is find pr dt. Okay, so uh, this is, you could potentially start off with r, like we did in the past, write r as a function of theta, but theta is omega t, and then differentiate and get the answer like I did last time, but you can also do it by simply using the chain rule. So I'm going to build off from where I left off. We know that 
dr d theta is s of i times r right we derived this formula earlier i'm just going to build off that i need to find dr dt by the chain rule this is same as dr d theta d theta dt so dr d theta is s i times r the first expression the second one d theta dt is simply omega because a theta is omega t so if you take derivative with respect to time you'll get omega but that omega is just a scalar in this case right it's a scalar because theta is a scalar time is a scalar so omega has to be scalar so what i can do is i can move this inside inside the s matrix and what i have is a formula for omega x times r so what this is saying is if you want to find dr x theta d t it is s of omega x times r so now we've got to the point where we've actually found an expression for angular speed earlier we only looking at rotations if you omega x is basically the rate of change of r with respect to time and not just any r but x uh, theta the question about the theta axis x axis about an angle theta okay so this is uh, the second step which is finding dr dt the next step and the final step is going to be how Okay, so this is basically motivating the fact that if you have a planar rotation, then that's just omega uh, equals omega j, k. But if you have rotations which are more complicated, rotation about the x and rotation about the y, how do you add those rotations? How how do you add those angular uh, motions? So there is a way to do that, and uh, I'm going to show you just that. We'll derive the formula for that. Okay, and we'll motivate this with. Uh, two successive rotations so consider the following rotation sequence okay so we are frame 0 okay that's a base frame we rotate to a new frame o1 x1 y1 z1 and then to a new frame O2, X2, Y2, Z2. And uh, what I'm assuming is that these rotations are uh, about different axes. So maybe you first rotate about the Z axis and then rotate about the X axis. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to, and when you're rotating them, you're rotating with different speeds. So omega, first one would be omega K, the second would be omega X. And what we want to do is you want to find the net rotation of that uh, object about uh, frame zero. How do we do that? So, so we've already derived a formula for R dot. It's S times R, right? And we can uh, put any indices to give any indices to R, right? You can put whatever you want. So you can put in this case, I'm going to do two zero because I'm looking at rotations. I'm trying to relate rotations in frame two with respect to frame zero. So I'd have to put the same two indices here. And then this would be a uh, rotation about x, well, uh, frame two with respect to frame zero. And I'm just sticking to my convention I talked about earlier. Okay, so this is from the earlier derivation. Now. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to find an alternate expression for R2 dot, which involves omega 0, 1, because 
when you rotate the body, it's not only rotating about axis uh, two, it's also rotating about axis one. So here is an alternate expression. for r2.0. By the way, this is what we're interested in. This is an unknown. We're trying to solve for omega 2 with respect to frame 0, right? Because here we have two rotations, one about the frame 0, one, uh, frame 0 to 1, frame 1 to 2. And so eventually this body ends in frame 2. And we're trying to find the angular velocity of that object in frame two with respect to frames one and frame zero. So that's an unknown. I'm going to try to find another expression for R2 dot, and then I will compare that one with this one and get an expression for omega zero comma two. So let's start off with the formula for R2 zero. It's R one zero times R two one. So differentiate with respect to time with respect to time. So I get R2 dot equals, I got to use the uh, product rule here for the derivative since both of those will change with respect to time. So first take the derivative of the second expression, keep this Derivative of the first expression, keep the second one constant, plus uh, keep the first one as it is, take the derivative of the second term. So that's it. Okay. I'm going to try to simplify this expression. Let me call it 1. Simplify this expression, call it 2. And then sub that in. So let's simplify 1. Okay, when I'm simplifying, I'm trying to solve, I'm trying to get this expression in such a way that I can pretty much pull out r to zero from it. I want to write it in such a way that it will be equal to something times r to zero, that r to zero, so that I can then compare this expression with that expression. So how can I relate r to zero with what I have here? I have r to one here. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to write I'm going to try to get rid of r dot. I have already derived a formula for r dot. It's s times omega times r. And when I write this, I have to put the corresponding uh, frame. So in this case, it's 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay. So this is just a definition for r dot. Okay, now what I observe is that I have this term here. If I multiply R10 with R21, I end up with R20, right? This time this is the same as that time R20. So I can write R20 there. So my first expression reduces to So I did get it in this form. Somewhat like this. I essentially want to plug out, pull the R to 0 to the right side, which I already have. Let's try to simplify expression 2. Okay, this one. Okay, that expression was R10 times R21 dot. So again, I'll do the same thing, which is I'll try to write r dot, expression for r dot, from what I've derived so far, r10 times s omega times r. And when I write this down, I have to write that particular r, the particular frame I'm looking at. So this would be 2, 1, and then uh, 1, 2. which is respect to frame one. Okay, 
Now, as I said, I'm trying to get R2 with respect to frame zero on the right side, not R2 one. So I need to do some uh, manipulation of the right side. So what I'm going to do is the following. R10 S omega one, two, one, as it is. I'm going to write in between this and this R, R10. Okay, and I can just write R10. I can't create it from uh, nowhere. I need to write something which will make sense. So I write R1 transpose. And the only reason I could do this is because this expression is identity. Right? R transpose time R is identity or R R transpose identity. So I can write, uh, I can put that expression anywhere I want. And the only reason I wrote that is because I can combine these two. To write R one zero S mega one two one R one zero transpose and I've, I'll combine the two ones I highlighted. That is R two zero. Okay, so it turns out that I can also simplify this expression. So recall, I wrote down. S times R omega is R S of omega R transpose. This was one of the formulas or properties of a skew symmetric matrix. If you have S R omega, it's always R S omega R transpose. So you see that that's R, that's S omega, that's R transpose. So I can write this whole thing as S R omega, where R is 1, 0. So this is R, sorry, S of R10, and I need to keep the same omega as it is, so omega 1 to 1. Okay, so now I think I'm all set to go back to, let me call this 1. I'm going to go back to one. I already found a formula for the number one and number two. And I'm going to just sub it here and try to write a formula for R2.0. So that is equals the first term, which is this. So I'll write that down. Omega zero one plus the second term, which is this one. From one, one, two. I think I'm forgetting something. This is missing something. There should be R20, I forgot that. Okay, this looks good. Okay, so I see there's R20, R20. I can factor that out. Okay, now we can use the associative rule. To combine the S's, so I'll write this as S omega 0, 1, 0 plus R 1, 0, omega 1, 2, 1 times R 2, 0. Okay, but what I'm what after was trying to find another way of writing this expression, right? Let me call this two. Just rewrite this over there. So, but R two zero is equal to S mega zero two. So we can 
from to. I wrote the same down, essentially copy pasted it. So we can say from two, which I wrote down here, and three, we see that omega zero to zero equals omega zero one zero plus r one zero omega one two. Okay, so this is how you can relate rotations. It's not just summing up the angular speeds, but you need to introduce the rotation matrix. That's the key. So it's not just a sum. That's it's in there. And so this is just telling you how, if you think of your end effector, which is basically two, is moving with respect to base frame. It's basically how link one moves, and how two moves with respect to link one. So this is basically telling you, if you think of your hand as a manipulator, uh, zero, one, two, then of course your end effect is going to be there. Then zero, one is rotation of this piece, this leg with respect to the base frame. One, two is basically telling you how this rotates with respect to this. Okay, that's the rate motion. And then R one zero is the rotation matrix so with this one with respect to base frame. Uh, so you can generalize this. This is the last thing, and I'll stop. We generalize this to n frames. That is, if you have n n effectors, then you can write this as omega zero n equals omega zero one zero plus r one zero omega one two one. So this is the what I written down. First two pieces. You can just keep going with this. R two zero omega two comma three two plus R three zero omega three comma four three plus so on. We continue in the next line. Uh, ends with. R n minus one zero omega n minus one n n minus one. Okay, you can also write this as if you like to write it in a shorter hand notation. It's basically omega zero one zero plus omega. One two zero plus omega one, sorry two three. Omega n minus. Okay, where clearly omega one two with respect to frame zero is r one zero omega one two one omega two three zero equals. R two zero omega two three two, and so you can see the pattern. Omega n minus. This is another way of writing the same expression. If you like to keep it simple like this, then uh, so this is basically showing you how uh, rotations from frame one to one to two are related to one to two in frame zero. This frame one, frame zero, two, zero. Eventually, we're only interested in rotations about the base frame because we want all our end effectors or whatever to we want to observe how they move in the global. 